let me introduce myself. I am Abubakar Siddiq Ango, a developer evangelism program manager at GitLab. And I'm also a Google developer expert for cloud, uh, things around uh, uh, scalable infrastructure, and a CNCF ambassador. I've, lately, my interest has been in supply chain security and uh, uh, I've been sharing quite a lot of content around that also. I'm based in The Hague, Netherlands. Yeah, just around two, three hours flight from Dublin. <laughs> but hopefully get to see you uh, to next time. You can always check me up on my website, which is on abuango.me. Now, today we'll be talking about containers and container runtime. What exactly are containers? Now, traditional deployment of our applications used to be, oh, you've written your application, you set up your hardware or your server that you want to use, install your operating system, and install your application. Basically, it takes up the whole machine, the whole hardware. That is, uh, if you are using a metal server. Now, but things evolved to we having virtualized deployment where you, you have on your uh, metal hardware, uh, metal server, that's your hardware server, you'll have installed your operating system. Then install a, hy a hypervisor. It can be VMware or VirtualBox or Kimo or whichever one. And with the hypervisor, you can then create individual virtual machines. Now these virtual machines are completely isolated from each other, each having its own operating system and the binary is needed for your applications to run, including your application and it runs. This is how most cloud environments work. You can create VMs, you can go on GCP or AWS or any of them, create VMs. These VMs are running on top of a hypervisor that is able to provision those servers almost uh, on request. Now, but things have evolved to where, yeah, we all know this term of, hey, I built an application, but it works on my machine. But now, how do we ensure that what works on your machine also works on live environment? Basically, we should just ship your machine. And that is the concept around containers. Not, not that we are going to take your machine and put it online, but the binaries and everything the setup that ensures that the application runs on your system is replicated online and using what we call containers and container runtime. Now, the way it works is you have your hardware, you have your operating system installed. Then on top of that layer, instead of a, of a hypervisor, you have a container runtime. Basically, the job of the container runtime is to take the specification that has been set by your application uh definition then talk to the operating system to provide the resources that your application needs to provide the different components that your application would need to run while your application comes with the necessary binary it need, binaries it needs to run and starts running within the environment created for it by the container runtime so basically you are not, your application is not running isolated. Your container is not running isolated. It's running alongside other containers, sharing the same resources with the host operating system that is provided. Now, your uh, operating system can even have access to some of the processes or some of the files that have been generated by the containers. And your container can even communicate with one another. So basically, a container is a bundle of your application and all the binaries it needs to run. While the container runtime ensures that the operating system is able to provide everything that your application needs based on the specification provided. Now, let's go through. In the past, the Linux, there has been several ways the community has tried to replicate containers, right? From the inception of Linux, there has been ways that, oh, we need to restrict this process or this application to run within a sandbox or within a, an environment. And there has been different ways to jail processes to certain parts so, so that there won't be conflict or there won't, a process won't tamper with another file or something else that another process needs. And the concepts like CH roots have been coming up 
jails that have been coming up within the environment right from the early 2000s. And it evolved into C groups where Google introduced, okay, on this server, how do we restrict the amount of RAM, the amount of CPU that a process needs? How do we make sure that the, uh, a process that is running does not overuse beyond what it needs? So that's where C groups came in, introduced by Google. And we, it, more things that were introduced include namespaces. Namespaces involve a group of resources within the Linux operating system can be a, you, you can create a set of resources within uh, the Linux operating system that it can be accessed by a process. So, and they can easily be identified that, okay, this process, this is the uh, maybe uh, host resources or networking resources or any other resources that it needs. And with C groups, you are able to then limit that, okay, these resources that you are consuming, this is the limit you can reach and this is how you can enjoy them. Then there were more advances to using all this uh, growth that have been coming up within the ecosystem, like C groups and new spaces, now applying them to, okay, let's now see, use all these concepts to create containers. That's where things like the LXC came up. And that is the stage from which Docker became uh, a thing. Now, let's dip down a bit, the concept of CA shoot. Let's add in the image here, we have our root directory on our system, which is the slash. And from there you have your normal Linux directories like the bin, home, user. Now let's now assume there's a user called me and a folder has been created called test. From this folder, we want to jail a process that is running on our Linux machine to this test folder and I ensure that any time it tries to access root, instead of taking it to the main root folder, tests, the test directory becomes its root and all the binaries and files it needs can be referenced from there. So let's say it says slash bin, instead of going to the main slash bin, it stays in its own slash bin, which is actually slash bin, slash me, slash test, slash bin. So this way a process only uh, gets access to file storage, the file system that has been restricted to it. Now, let's look at it a different way. We have our root folder in yellow, the slash in yellow. Then we have uh, with the regular uh, system files on the file system. From there, we go to home, then we we'll go to Joe. But within Joe, we created another slash, another root directory with bin and all the files that a uh, regular operating system file. So now if there's a process that has been jailed to the root folder within Joe, anytime it tries to access any system resources, it only has access to the one within the Joe home directory. It cannot access the ones outside. This way, a process is unable to tamper with the main operating system or access the files or resources of another process. Now, then another concept that is very crucial to our understanding of containers is namespaces. There are different resources on the operating system. We have uh, like the PID, which is the process ID. We have network resources. You have users and groups within the system. We have mount point. We have system V and a couple of other things that the system needs, like information about this, uh, the, the host system, the system's domain name, etc. Now, all these namespaces are different resources, different grouping that can happen within your system. Let's say, for example, we have PID1, which is the init that starts every process within the system. But we already have a one. PID, process ID one, within, let's say within your container, within your jail environment, you want to create a new process that will have a PID one. There'll be a conflict with the main system resources, right? Now, but what if a namespace has been created for your application that wants to run? 
and everything around process ID starting from one and so on and so forth is only limited within that set within that group. The same thing with network resources. Okay, what are the different network resources or users or groups that can be accessed by your process, that can be used by your process or mount points? So with namespaces, you are able to create a set of resources that can be accessed like a group of resources that can be accessed, referenced, and accessed by different resources within your system. Now, another thing is C groups. Now, what C groups brings is setting limits and restrictions. Let's say, for example, a process wants to use memory. Hey, it's request for memory. And uh, let's say like uh, 10 gig in the image cartoon uh, you can see here, uh, thanks to Julia Evans, she's a very good artist. And she, uh, check her out, she uh, tries to describe a lot of Linux and technology-based uh, information in graphical interfaces that you can easily understand. Now, here's an example of them. Let's say a process wants to use 10 gigabytes of memory and the Linux operating system tells it, oh, I, I can only give you one gig. It gives it one gig. Then you now have a group of resources, a group of processes. We call them C group. In this group, everyone can then can say, oh, uh, hey, we need resources. But for that C group, you can restrict and say, oh, all three of you can only get 500 MB of memory with set limits. So if for any reason, one of the processes now uses a lot of memory, like one gig, it can be killed, OOM, out of memory. And if it is, if it is using too much CPU processes, it gets slowed down. Its requests are no longer prioritized or it hits by a particular quota. So this way, different components within the system that are grouped together can be limited by how much resources they can consume. This concept is used for containers to say, oh, we have these processes for this particular container. Let's give it this memory. Let's give it this CPU. And they should not rest, go beyond those resources that has been allocated for it. C groups bring this concept for container technology. Now, let's now go deep into containers itself. When uh, from the image here, we are all familiar with Docker. Docker made container cool. Docker made container approachable and usable by everyone by providing a lot of binaries and other components that uh, users can use to uh, create containers. Oh, you can just uh, Docker image pool, Docker run this, Docker and so on and so forth. And immediately you can easily create a container. But Docker is doing this by having what we call Docker daemon, a Docker engine that is sitting, that is installed on your system that does all the, receives requests from you communicates it to uh, the runtime that is running the container engine, uh, the Docker engine, and tells that tells the operating system, oh, create this container image, do this and do that. Now, one of the, we will have noticed recently of the issue in the Kubernetes community where uh, Docker was, um, deprecated from Kubernetes and it became an uproar on Twitter. It's because when Kubernetes was originally uh, developed, Docker was baked into it, it was hard coded into it. But it came to a point that it was adding and they had to introduce uh, a layer within Kubernetes that translates requests and other things from Kubernetes to Docker. And a lot of other uh, organizations started, oh, since it's not only Docker that's available as a container engine, we want to use others, other container runtime that are available out there. It became difficult for Kubernetes to now say, okay, let's allow some of these other 
uh, container technologies. So that extra layer called Docker shim had to be introduced that then uh, translate all commands and all requests to Kubernetes. So it's one of the reasons why new container technologies and a lot of others that we've not been hearing before came up. But if we are looking at Adihood, what basically happens? When you execute a Docker command, in the image here, you will see we have the client tool, which is what uh, talks to, what you use, what you call when you are running your Docker commands or you are using the Docker interface. It talks to another tool called container D. And this container D is like the high level runtime that receives your request and translates uh, it to tell the low level runtime, which here we call run C, that which in turn tells the operating system, this is what you need to do. You need to create this container. These are the resources you need to add for to it. These are the applications you need to do. Now, from there, your application starts and it runs. So basically container D manages your container, uh, how it's running, how it's executing, but run C at the low level, initiates the creation and preparation of the container. Now, Docker made a lot of contribution to the ecosystem. Initially, they decoupled their Docker, and, uh, their Docker engine and removed container D and run C and contributed it to the community. And this contribution that they made led, led to collaboration with other entities to to now come up with the Open Container Initiative. Now, the Open Container Initiative then created a standard to say, what should a runtime do? What should a container look like? How should they all communicate? So that we'll have a standard across. That way, an application or a service or some orchestration to whatever it is can easily understand any container that is created by any runtime or any clients too. Now, like I was saying in the beginning, Docker was made to be very easy to use by everyone, but it came at a price. Automation became difficult. Several layer of abstraction had to be added before it can be used. So Docker recognized this and that was one of the reasons why they decided to contribute run C and container D to the community. Now, Basically, any runtime that was creating a container can be able to create, start, get the state of it, kill it, or delete. And it does all this talking to the container image and uh, the, the container that is running. This way, with this standard, any container can work the same way, either on a laptop or anywhere the same standard is maintained. Basically, the OCI is saying, this is how a container should be created. And this is how it should run and execute. And that standard is maintained across all environments that the container needs to run. Now, there are different types of container runtimes. We have uh, uh, container D, which was uh, open sourced and currently maintained under the CNCF. Then we have the Create IO. Now, Container Runtime Interface, uh, oh, my, I can't remember what the O means. This, we, the Kubernetes community discovered, okay, we need a way to be able to, uh, for the kubelet component of Kubernetes, to be able to execute container commands with the runtimes in uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Now, okay, let's say a kubelet has received the specification, deploy this container. It uses Creo to now say, oh, Creo creates this container for me. Creo talks to Run C, Run C creates it, and the deployment happens. Now, there are different type of runtimes, from the low level to the high level to those that have specialized functions. Now. If you check the CNCF landscape, you get information about different types of containers 
that are out there. But we'll be looking at a few of them. Now, at a high level, the most common one that you have is container D. Now, from the images we've seen previously, we see that your clients too, which can be uh, anyone, but in this case, Docker, speaks to container D. Oh, I need this container to run. This is the, my image. Then container D sends it to the low level. The same thing with Creo, the same thing with Docker and Podman. There are different reasons why some of these were created. Docker engine was like the most popular one before container D. Now, Podman was introduced because it, most of the others require root level access to be able to create those containers. So with Podman, because it's only a pod manager, it only runs at the high level, uh, uh, making a request to the low level uh, container runtime. It doesn't require privilege access. Now, also uh, uh, the, at the higher level, the higher level container runtimes are also called container managers because their work mainly is to, oh, you are creating, you are starting, you are stopping and so on and so forth. And at the lower level, we have run C. Run C is like the standard. Now it's like the main low level container runtime that most other applications use program. There are others like RKT and so on, but a lot of the other low level uh, runtimes have been deprecated or no longer maintained. So low level uh, run C is like the main one that container D and Docker are based on. So let's say you execute a Docker command from Docker itself. Docker talks to container D. Container D passes it to run C. At the lower level, you, you can even use run C directly, but it's too low level for most use cases, except if you are using a container manager to communicate with run C. Now, when container D says, oh, I need a container. Here is the specification. Run C takes it, creates the container, and stops and passes the rest of the functionality to container D to continue execution. Now, another type of container that we have is the sandbox container runtimes. For the containers created by run C and the low level container runtimes, like we saw from the beginning, where the, your containers are not completely isolated. They are just, uh, a group of processes that are running to solve a particular task, but sharing the same system resources. And oftentimes there are resources, that's why they are the jailed and they are within namespaces. Their resources can, they can share resources and depending on the level of, of on what the application inside those containers are doing, they can actually access or affect the host operating system or affect other containers. So there are other solutions that provide an extra layer of protection or like isolation to ensure that applications don't go beyond where they are supposed to work or affect the host operating system. This comes in various formats, like the GVISOR, I think it was introduced by Google, and its own, the way it works is it creates like a proxy to the kernel to ensure that your request and your uh, to create to the request by the runtime to create resources and all the syscalls it makes to the kernel are not sent directly. It passes through the GVISOR proxy, which talks to the kernel. That way there's an added layer of security before things hit the kernel without escalating issues. Then we have Firecracker, which has which create, uses KMU uh, to create like a virtual environment, a sandbox environment for your container to run. Then Kata basically uses virtual machines. Virtual machines are created for your containers. That way there's complete isolation of your container. It, there's no way some of the activities it does will impact the host operating system or other containers. Now, there are two major use cases for using container runtimes. The first one is built for build systems. 
as a developer, you want to be able to run uh, your applications, build your setup, create builds for your application, or create standard environments that anyone within a company, let's say, for example, can easily kickstart a project or start working on a project because they already have a container that contains everything they need. So and major runtime requirements here is to, okay, you need a runtime to build your images, you need a runtime to run it, and you need maybe a tool or a runtime to distribute the images. Then the second use case is container orchestration. These are where, okay, after in some situations, your container might not need some serious orchestration. Basically, it wants, maybe your use case is just, oh, run your container within your cluster, provide the necessary port forwarding for it, and your application runs maybe on port 80 or port 8080, just a single container or a couple of containers and you are fine. You don't need a lot of scalability. But when you need scale, you need a way to be able to create your container images, pass it to an orchestrator, for example, Kubernetes, and it takes that image, deploys it as a container on a pod and it runs. Now, one of the major requirements of container runtimes for the for orchestrators are basically to be able to do get images and run your application. So creating the images is not necessarily a function of, container orchestrators don't need to create images. Images will have already been created, passed to it, and it runs the images. Now, for build systems, uh, I, hope this, I hope this image is not too small. There are, the main way that almost everyone is familiar is uh, basically by, by uh, using Docker. You use the Docker CLI. Oh, sorry. my stylus isn't working, no problem. Now, you, you run your Docker run image, which is Docker CLI. In the left side of this image, it's the Docker CLI. Now, once you talk to the Docker CLI, which is the client to Docker CLI will then talk to the Docker engine. And that Docker engine talks to container D. Now, container D then executes, uh, prepares the instruction and passes it to run C. And run C talks to the Linux kernel. But this is for Docker. And Docker comes with a whole suite of tools. The Docker uh, binary comes with a whole suite, they put the client, the uh, Docker engine to build the, the containers, etc. And before it talks to, container D. But if you are not using Docker, or probably due to licensing issues or due to company policies, you need other tools, especially that are open source to be able to create your containers. And we have for you, for images, talking to image registry, publishing to them or pulling from them, you have Scopio. With Scopio, you can communicate and interact with uh, container registries. Then we have Podman, which is a container manager. You can use it to uh, create containers. You've pulled your image. Now you want to create containers. You want to check pods. You want to do uh, exe. You want to exe, uh, exe into them, and so on and so forth. Then, if you want to build images, we have Builder. With Builder, you can build container images. Let me try again. Whether oh, it's not working. Awesome. Okay, we have Builder. And Builder here, Builder builds, basically builds your images. But Podman is the one that talks with Run C. Builder can build your image and uh, Scopio can publish it to uh, an image registry. But Podman pulls the image and passes it to Run C to, ex uh, to communicate with Linux kernel. So if you mostly your choice is the way, why we, do we have different tools for different things? It basically uses the Unix philosophy, doing one thing and doing it well. So instead of a bundled solutions, doing a lot of things like the way Docker does. Now, the, oh my, my stylus. Okay, the next thing is, but when it comes to container orchestration, we looked at, uh, let me use my keyboard, 
We looked at on the build system. You can use all of this, but on the orchestration side in a Kubernetes cluster, we will see here that normally if you use Docker, when Docker was being used, it communicates with container D, uh, Docker D, which talks to container D and runs uh, it with run C to create the containers. But Kubernetes has created, uh, with Kubernetes having container runtime interfaces, the runtime interfaces are uh, those runtimes that handles the communication between, uh, like a standard that handles communication between the kubelet and uh, the runtime environment run C. So kubelet can use container D to talk to run C or you use Creo uh, to talk to run C. That, that way there's no restriction or a specific uh, lock-in for a particular Docker clients that needs to be used or runtime that needs to be used. Unlike before, where Docker was built into Kubernetes. So now you as an individual can decide, oh, I need uh, performance, speed and so on. I want to be able to talk to Ron C directly. I want, uh, or I'm basically a developer and I want to build my images on my system. You use builder, B-U-I-L-D-A-H, or you want to, publish your repository um, images to, after you've built with Builder, you want to push your images to a container registry or pull from it, you can use Copio. And you want to be able to run your containers, build, uh, create containers, and you require a container manager. Podman does it for you. And Podman communicates with container D in your system, which in turn talks to run C to build your images. Now, alternatively, if you have to use Docker or you can still use Docker, it's available, though there are restrictions on what you can do depending on the size of your company, you can always use Docker. But one using Docker is not the alternative. You can use Podman with uh, Scopio and Builder. But on the container orchestration side, you can decide to run, oh, I'm using Kubelet with container D or I'm using Creo on the Docker, Kubernetes documentation. You can have several, uh, there are documentation on how you can set this up. Now, if your requirement requires more sandboxing or more restrictions around security on the container orchestration, you can use GVisor or use Kata. In Kubernetes, you can create a runtime class and specify GVisor so that anytime a uh, kubelet is deploying containers into a pod, it ensures that they are using uh, GVisor instead of run C to deploy your applications on Kubernetes. Yeah, that's the end of this session. I hope you've uh, learned a thing or two on the different container runtimes that we have and how you can make a good choice in which one to use for your project or for your deployments. I'll be available for questions and uh, looking forward to hear from you. You can follow me on Twitter at sorikey247 or check out my website at Talk to you soon.